Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. Shabbos Daf Kof Tess is devoted primarily to a discussion of various different medical treatments on Shabbos. We'll discuss some of them as to whether or not they're effective in the first place, and the ones which are effective or somewhat effective, are you allowed to use them on Shabbos? Now, the general introduction to medical treatment on Shabbos is that there are three levels of medical treatment. One is treatments for a uh, uh, an ache or a pain or something like that. That is forbidden on Shabbos because if one is allowed to do that, one would end up grinding herbs. Somebody who is actually sick is allowed to do things which are also derabanan, and somebody who is in a life-threatening situation is even allowed to do things which are also deraisa. Now, as far as the aches and the pains, which is what we'll be discussing primarily on the daf today, the treatments for that are not allowed if they are actions or chemicals that are clearly only taken for medicinal value. If it's something that a normal person would do, it's not a problem. So, for example, eating a lot of oranges would not be us or if you want the vitamin C that's in them, because normal people also eat oranges. So now, the Gemara first begins by discussing something else. It's referring to the tumma, the ruach ra, the spirit which is on the hands when one awakes in the morning, and the Gemara brings a brisa. Rabbi Nassim says that it's a very a uh, fancy lady, that spirit, and it will not leave unless you wash your hands very nicely three times each hand. Now, the Gemara says that if you did touch your hands with the Ruach on it and it caused injury to the eye, the way to cure that is by applying a type of eye makeup called Puch, which also stops the eye from tearing, and it also increases the eyelashes. The Gemara has a brace up, which says the same three things. Okay, now the Gemara says... A number of other plants and as to whether or not they're effective in healing the eyes. Marok said alin is a type of herb is not effective for the eyes. Rav Yosef said kuzbara, which is a coriander, is not effective even for him. Um, he said it's actually even harmful for me. He was blind, but it was still harmful for him anyway. Rav Shesha said uh, hops, what they used to make beer, is not useful for the eye. And then there's something called gargira, which Rav Shesha says is beneficial to the eye even for me. Rav Shesha was also blind. Uh, Rashi says. Now, uh, as far as the hops, the kishus, so the Gemara says, Marukva says, the name of Shmuel, you're allowed to use all of them for medicines on Shabbos, except for one called the Teruza. We don't know what that is, but that you're not allowed to use for Shabbos. Okay, now the Gemara discusses um, something else here. It's actually a Machuk's Rishon, what this thing is entirely. We'll go with the Rabbi Hanan of Pshat, that we're referring to straining the water out of watermelons or other types of melons. So that water has medicinal properties. So the Gemara says, the Rebchizda says that you are allowed to strain that water, but you're not allowed to strain the liquids from an egg. That you would not be allowed to do. The issue over here is straining, not so much the medicine that you want to use it for. So the Gemara says that Zairi's wife once strained the watermelon fluids for Chia Barashi, who was the Talmud of her husband Zairi, on Shabbos, and he didn't want to eat it. So she said, I did it for your Rebbe, for my husband Zairi, so how come you don't want to eat it? So the Gemara says, because he argued on Zairi about this. Zairi said, you're allowed to strain something clear. You're allowed to strain clear. <laughs> wine or clear water, it's not a problem, because you're not actually straining anything out. So this watermelon, you're not straining anything out. But um, Chia Barashi did not agree with that. The Gemara says that somebody who injured his hand or his foot, and he has a bruise or a swelling or a cut, and he wants to put on wine in order to harden it, to help strain it, to help drain it. So the Gemara says he's allowed to put on wine because it's not particularly effective, but he's not allowed to put on vinegar because that is very effective. The Gemara also says that uh, Hill said to, uh, that um, Mechuza, in the town of Mechuza, the people's skin is more sensitive, and therefore even wine would be effective. You wouldn't be allowed to put wine on the bruise to help heal that. Now the Gemara has a story here that Ravina once went to visit Ravashi, and he saw that he had injured his foot because it got stepped on by a donkey, and he was applying vinegar to it to reduce the swelling. So he said 
uh, there's two versions of this. Either he said, first of all, why are you applying vinegar? You're not allowed to apply that. Or he was applying wine, and he said, you're like the Mahusa people. Your skin is very sensitive. You shouldn't be allowed to apply wine. Either way, he answered him, and he said that you are allowed to, because that was only referring to a bruise on the hand. But this is a bruise on the foot. The bruise on the foot is considered like an internal organ injury, which is a question of sakonis It could be life-threatening, and therefore you are allowed to be Mechal Shabbos, for that. Okay, now the Gemara discusses washing oneself in certain waters, which one have medicinal value and which ones do not. So the Gemara says you're allowed to wash in the water of Geror, it's not going to do that much for you. You're allowed to wash in the water of Hamson, uh, it's near Tveria. You're allowed to wash in the water of Tveria, that's the hot springs there, but you should not bathe in the waters of the Mediterranean Sea, and you should not wash yourself in water that was used to soak flax, and you should not wash yourself in the the Dead Sea. All these three are not usually used for washing by healthy people. So if you're doing it, it obviously indicates that it's medicine and therefore you wouldn't be allowed to do it. Now the Gemara is a contradiction. You have a different Mbrisa that says all these halachas except for the Dead Sea, except for the Mediterranean Sea. It says you are allowed to uh, swim in the Mediterranean Sea. You are allowed to wash in the Mediterranean Sea on Shabbos. You don't have to worry about medicine. So we have a contradiction here between whether you are or not allowed to bathe in the waters of the Mediterranean Sea. So the Gemara says it's not a problem, it's two different people, because we have a machlekes between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda about the status of the waters of the Mediterranean Sea. So the Gemara says, what's this machlekes? It's about a totally different issue altogether. It's concerning Chalakas and Mekvais. The halacha is that uh, there are there are two classes of water as far as Chalakas Mikvah. There is Mikvah and Mayan. Mikvah means... Um, Water which is not from a natural spring. Mayan is water from a spring. There, they have a few major differences in halacha. Mayan water could be used for a zav. It could be used for a mitzayra. It could be used for a para aduma, and it could be used for a regular person, even if it's flowing, moving water. Mikvah water can't be used for any for any of those, and it can't be used unless it's still water. Now, the question is, what about the oceans? What do they count as? Specifically, the Mediterranean Sea and the other oceans. So the Gemara says we have a machokis here about this between um, Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda. Rabbi Meir says all the oceans of the world are called a mikvah. When the Torah in Bereshis describes the creation of the oceans, he calls them mikveh hamayim. So they're called mikvah. So all the, they all have the halachic status of a mikvah, and they are not usable for any of the things that you need a mayan for. Rabbi Huda says no. Mikvah was only referring to the Yam Hagadol, the Great Sea, which includes the Mediterranean Sea, because that is a mixture of all the seas and the rivers of the world. They all flow into there and connect to there eventually. All the other seas of the world are not called Mikvah. Those would have a status of a Mayan. And then, actually, we have a third opinion, which is Rabbi Yaisi, who says that the rest of the seas of the world actually have a split halacha. You can consider them to be flowing water, Mayan. As far as flowing water, you can use them. They do have the halacha of a Mayan. But as far as being used for Azav and Matsurya and uh, Paraduma water, they don't count for all of those. So anyway, the Gemara wants to say, here you see a machlokas as to what the halachic status of the Great Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, is. And therefore, that would also be the machlokas here about whether or not you're allowed to swim in it. So... so the Gemara asks right away, this has nothing to do with mikvah. We're not talking about where somebody wants to go to the mikvah. We're talking about where somebody wants to swim in it in order to heal himself. So it should not have any connection to that machokis at all. So the Gemara says, you're right, I'll give you a different answer. The answer is that the Bryce that says you're allowed to swim is referring to somebody who doesn't stay there for a long time. He goes in for a dip to cool himself off. It doesn't look like something medical because anybody would do that. The one that says it's forbidden means to stay in there for a long time. That you'd only do if it's medicinal. So the Gemara says that that can't be, because both Bryce has said that you're not allowed to go into flax water, and flax water, that difference applies. Flax water, you're allowed to stay in there for a short time, but not for a long time. So if you're correct that one of these Bryce's was referring to staying in there for a short time, that Bryce should say you're allowed to stay in flax water also. It, it does not say that. It's saying that you are allowed to stay in the water of the Great Sea, but not the water of flax water. So obviously it's not referring to where it's a short time, it's all referring to where it's a long time. So the Gemara therefore answers that, okay, the answer is that there are two parts to the waters of the Mediterranean. There's the good, nice, clear, fresh water that you're allowed to go into, because that even a healthy person would, but the cloudy, the uh, murky, foul waters of it you should not go into, that only a sick person would do. As far as flax, 
the flax water, so that's not a problem that you have one a bryce that says you are allowed to go into it, and one that says you're not, because like you said, one is referring to where you're in there for a long time, and one is referring to where you're in there for a short time. This takes us to a Mishnah. The Mishnah continues the discussion of uh, herbs and their potential uses, and whether they're permitted or not on the Shabbos. The Mishnah and the Gemara that follows continues to list various different remedies, and uh, things that you're allowed to do on Shabbos, and those which you are not. So the Mishnah begins by discussing Ezovioin. It's very similar to the Ezoiv, which is mentioned in the Torah as part of the um, items used in the carbon of the Paraduma. So the Mishnah says that as far as Ezovioin, you're not allowed to eat on Shabbos because no healthy person would eat that, but you're allowed to eat Yoezer or drink Abu Vroya. The Gemara looks what these things are. Now the Gemara says, any type of food you're allowed to uh, eat on Shabbos, even if you intend to heal yourself with it, because normal people would eat it. Any type of drink you're allowed to drink, except for water of a palm tree, or the uh, cup that they give people to drink so that they shouldn't be able to be reproducing. Uh, These two things are good for um, discoloration of the skin when he turns green. Uh, as far as somebody wants to drink these things in order to quench his thirst, so those he is allowed to do, even though it's medicinal, if he's not intending medicine, then he's allowed to. And as far as the oil of the roots that are used to make people sterile, that's okay if it's not meant to be healing anything at all. So now the Gemara defines a few of these things. First of all, what's Azov in the Torah and Azov in the Mishnah? Rav Yosef says, Azov is the one that grows in a place called Gemi, that's the species called Hamag. It grows in the reeds and in the swamps. And Azov Yon grows amongst the thorn bushes, uh, which are in a much drier area. Okay, now, another shot as to what Azov is. Ula says it's a white plant called Marva, which is like sage. The Gemara says that Ula went to the house of Shmuel Bar Yehuda and they brought him some of this white sage. And he said, oh, this is the Azov of the Torah. Okay, third explanation as to what Azov is, is we have a poppy. He says it's a herb called Shumshuk. And the Gemara says, Rav Yirmiya Midifti agreed with that. And he said that, that makes sense because when the when the mitzvah of the Azov in the Paraduma was performed, it says you needed three stalks of the plant that each one has three grain sections on it. And the only plant that you could get three stalks with three grain sections each, that is an Azov species, is the Shumshuk. Okay, now the Gemara says, what's an Azavian healed for? What is that for? So the Gemara says that it heals worms in the stomach. If you eat it with seven black dates, how do you get worms in the stomach in the first place? The Gemara says that's if you eat barley flour, which was ground more than 40 days ago. Now, Yoezer, the Gemara says it's Pusnak. What's that for? That's for our worms in the liver. And you eat that with seven white d- d- dates. And how do you end up with worms in the liver? So there's a few things that can cause that. That can be from eating raw meat and drinking water on an empty stomach, or eating fatty meat on an empty stomach and then water, eating ox meat and then water on an empty stomach, eating a nut on an empty stomach and then water, eating stems of the black-eyed peas plant on an empty stomach and then drinking water. All these things cause worms. Now, if you don't have Yoezer, there's a couple of other ways to heal it. One of them is you, say you could eat white uh, tachli, which is cress. And if he doesn't have that, then he should do the following thing. He should fast for a few days. And then they should bring very fatty meat and roast it on the grill. And then he should suck the juice of the meat and drink a little bit of vinegar. Some say not to take the vinegar because that's not good for the liver. If he doesn't have all that, he should take the bark of a bush that was peeled off downwards, not upwards. Because if you peel it upwards, the worms will come out through his mouth. If you peel it downwards, it'll come out through the bottom. And he should boil the bark in beer when the sun is about to set. Or when it's ready, Bain Hashmashois. Then the next day, he should drink it with his ears and nose stuffed so that the strength of the liquid shouldn't escape. And then when he uh, relieves himself in the restroom, it should be onto the part of the tree that the bark was removed from. Okay, next, the Mishnah said, Abu Vraya, what's that? The Gemara says, that's Chum Teraya, uh, which is a tree which has no branches. The Gemara says, what is that used for? That's for water which was left open. We know that Chazal were always concerned that water that was left open may have snake venom in it, because the snake could have drunk from it. And uh, the Gemara now has a number of different cures for drinking snake water. Now, if you 
if you do not have that treat for the snake water, so then you should take five roses, five cups of beer, boil them all together, and drink one revius of that. Yeah, that was actually used by the mother of Rav Achtavay Barami. For certain, there was an individual who drank snake water, and she took one cup of beer and one rose. She boiled them together. She made him drink it. She lit an oven. She cleared out the oven to cool it off. She put a brick inside for him to sit on, and then uh, the poison came shooting out of him in a green river. Okay, if you don't have uh, that, then you should drink a revius of milk from a white goat. Or Rav Huna Bar Yehuda says you should take a very sweet esrog, make a hole in it, fill it with honey, and put it in the coals of a fire so it should cook, and then eat that. Now, uh, Rav Hanina says if you have urine that's 40 days old, you drink a tiny bit of it, um, that's good for a sting of a wasp. If you have a sting of a scorpion, then drink a revius of it. And if you have uncovered water, then drink uh, two revius of it. Um, and if you drink an entire four revius of it, which is an entire leg, then it's useful even against somebody who cast a spell on you through witchcraft. Now, anigrin is water that boils certain vegetables, like beets, or avangar, which is boiled bingari, or to or it has boiled balsam. Any of these things are good against snake water and witchcraft. Okay, now what happens if somebody swallowed a snake? So you have to feed him hops mixed with salt and make him run for three mil. Where it says a story that happened on this is two versions of it. Either it's Rishimi Bar Ashi who saw it to happen to somebody else, or Rishimi Bar Ashi himself swallowed the snake and El- Elio Hanavi cured him. Either way, the curer um, dressed up like a very uh, scary horseman. And he therefore made the person who swallowed the snake listen to him. He fed him these hops with the salt and made him run for three mil. That raised his body heat. The snake died and it came out in pieces. Now somebody who was bitten by a snake should get the uh, fetus of a white donkey. You should tear it open and put that on the bite. That will solve the problem as long as the donkey wasn't trafe. And we'll see tomorrow a story here. Drive the Daf is a project of the Grand Woodland School and is presented by Rabbi Yitzchak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaf at gmail.com.